Mike Gill in the house. It's a beautiful day to be in Philadelphia, South Jersey. If you're an Eagles fan anywhere around the country, Mike Gill, what what a game yesterday. What a performance. Yeah, well, Jeff, uh, dominating pretty much uh, from start to finish. I mean, a lot of people – look, I said all last week, I didn't think the game was going to be close. People got on me for it. Not because I thought that Philadelphia was two to three scores better than San Francisco. I don't think that's the case. It's just one of those things where you have a big game of that magnitude and it doesn't go your way. It's just like the energy gets zapped out of you and it starts to snowball. And I think, look, I know Purdy going out changed that game. But quite frankly, I don't think they were going to be in that game. <laughs> they just could not get a stop. Uh, they could not stop the Eagles' uh, run game. Purdy, I think, was spooked from the beginning. I mean, he he fumbled the ball. He got hit. He almost threw an interception. It just looked like it was bound to happen. Yeah, I know they tied it up with that drive, and it looked like, oh, this might be something. I don't know where they were getting a stop, man. I Their defense held them in that game as long as they could, and I know not having Purdy maybe kept that game close for a little while, but I think it was – the rubber band was going to break at some point. They just didn't have enough with or without Brock Purdy. Let's not make this about Brock Purdy getting hurt. The Eagles were just better than the Niners were. I asked people all week, who has a better 53? And the consensus was pretty much Philadelphia did and that they had a clear advantage at quarterback. Well, all of that pretty much played out. And the biggest matchup that I talked about on my show all week was who was going to block Reddick. Their game plan for Reddick was awful. Terrible. Horrible. And he absolutely, like he did the week before, wrecked that game. They just were not going to change that no matter if Brock Purdy played or not. The Eagles haven't had an edge rusher or a defensive end this dominant that could change the course of the game like a Sam Rex. It's A, Hugh Douglas in his prime. B, Reggie White and Clyde Simmons in their prime. I, I, that's how I feel about Hassan Ray. You're just waiting for the game-changing play. And when they put Tyler Croft on him, I'm like, oh, this may end badly. And it I, knocked Brock Purdy out. I tweeted early in the game. I said, it looks like the Niners' decision is to, like, chip and just send different people at him. I mean, the first couple plays of the game, I think there was a tight end. They tried to throw the receiver. They had a, the fullback go in motion. Yeah, it was, and then he knocked he knocked the Johnson out of the game too because they couldn't figure out a way to block him. Um, look, the Eagles defense, the John Gannon people. You got any of them in the chat today? Anybody hate John he's, Gannon? He, he's not a good defensive coordinator. It's the talent, Mike Gill. All right, that's an interesting uh, move of the goalpost. It is what it is. Um, I thought his game plan yesterday, you know. They they had a lot of pressure yesterday, but the secondary, that's where I think – and look, this is another thing. With the interior of the Eagles' offensive line, I, like real quick, just to kind of change. The two dominant areas of this game, I thought, were the Eagles up front where they had an advantage with Reddick and the interior, and then the Eagles' offensive line up front. They whipped San Francisco up front. So this game was really won with the technique and the and the the – the small, minute detail. Like, no one pays attention to interior offensive line play, right? But that's where the Eagles absolutely won. They just killed them in the middle of the line. They had no resistance at all in the middle of their defensive front. Um, you know, but go back to John Gannon. I thought the job that he did was outstanding. I mean, now, listen, once the game gets very one-dimensional, you know they're not throwing. That changes the dynamic of everything. But – Debo Samuel really was not a factor. Ayuk was not a factor. Kittle was not a factor very early in the game. Uh, it, 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 they, I thought they set the tone early that San Francisco was going to have to have Brock Purdy make plays to beat them, and I don't know that those plays were ever coming. I don't think they were either. By the way, when Trent Williams threw Kayvon Wallace down, I said – that is a team that is beaten, defeated, and never thought the Eagles defensive line would do what they did to them. I, San Francisco, they weren't cocky all week, but I think they thought they were going to come in there and actually beat this team up physically, and it was the other way around. 
Yeah, it goes back to what I said. It's of why a game, the final score ends up getting like that, is that you really believe that you're the better team, that you've prepared, you're ready for that moment. And then when what you prepared to do doesn't happen, you look up and you're like, this game's over. We're done. And you just don't see it happening that way. And I think San Francisco, look, they won 12 straight games. Um, They did it with a very impressive – I tweeted something in about Thursday or so about – People talk about the Niners defense number one overall. And I said, you know, you build this resume up to get your ranking against, I'm not saying bad teams, good teams, whatever. Like, ever, oh, you never, uh, you played a bad schedule, yada, yada. But you establish a ranking of your defense and offensive, you know, they're the number one rush defense. You establish that playing teams that aren't the Eagles. So that ranking gets thrown out the window for me. I don't care that you're the number one rush defense. You're the number one rush defense stopping teams. It stink for the most part. If you played Philadelphia every week, you're not the number one rush defense. So that number one rush defense to me, I thought was out the window. Those type of numbers just don't hold much merit for me in this game. And you saw why. They could not stop the Eagles run. And it was almost comical. The Eagles were like, guess what? We're running right at you. Here we come. They were showing it the whole time, the drive with Jalen Hurts. You know, they went right down the field. They couldn't stop him. And imagine if they had Hurts' arsenal. I still don't think they're using the whole Hurts' arsenal. I think he just kind of picking and choosing. And the one drive, he's decided, you know what, maybe I'll do, be, get, be a part of this game. He didn't throw the ball that well yesterday. And they had – the game could have been worse. Put it that way, 49ers. The game could and should have been far worse. So – for all the well, if Purdy played, I don't think Hertz was all that sharp. They had the fumble recovery that they didn't capitalize on. Uh, I I really looked at that game and said, man, this if the Eagles played well, they would have won that game fifty to seven. I got so much vitriol on the Bird app because 49ers fans did not, and NFL fans did not want to hear what I tweeted about. Well, that was an impressive catch by Devonta Smith. Oh, it wasn't a catch. Yes, it was a catch because the NFL scorebook says it was a catch. If you want to get upset over it not being a catch, blame the genius Kyle Shanahan for not challenging it. By the way, Kyle Shanahan does this a lot, Mike Gill. He always, his in-game situations are not very good. People should have learned this in Super Bowl 51. He's done this in 51. He's done this in 54. He's done this in the NFC Championship game. I was like, Kyle, Throw the flag, man. Just, I don't care if it's a catch or not. Just throw it. He didn't do it. And give credit to Devonta Smith. Give credit to Jalen Hurts for getting up to the line and making that catch a reality. Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of, uh, you know, Shanahan is a very smart game caller in terms of calling the plays. What we have seen from him in the past is he's not a great clock manager and timeout distributor and and that kind of stuff. Those are the things where he really struggles. Um yeah, that's a play where I think every Eagle fan understands that was not a catch. The ball hit the ground. But this thing's happened throughout the course of a game where your coach needs to step in there and say, we have evidence and we're going to challenge that play um, because these officials get calls wrong all the time. I, quite frankly, I don't like to call the block punt, uh, the, the roughing the punter. I hate that call. Yeah. Um, against it happened against the 49ers. I think that's not a good call. Uh, obviously, they got a ton of calls yesterday. I absolutely hate the 15 yard face mask call, the five yard face mask, 15 yard face mask. They need to go back to that because yeah. you're getting 15 yards for something that's completely accidental. That's what the five yard was in there for. The problem is they don't trust these officials to be able to decipher which is which. So they just give, but to get 15 yards tacked on for what that guy did yesterday, I think is ridiculous. So I think the Niners definitively had some reason to, there was a lot of calls in that game that just, you know, they they were, but look, that's what happens. They were undisciplined. They got out of hand and then it spirals. And, and, and there's your answer to why you get blown out of a game like that. Yeah. It, it, a couple of the Irish players said it too. They're like, well, the calls weren't why we lost the game for people who want to blame. They said, look, we, we command the whole, we can. Yeah. I agree with you on the, on the rough and the punter. That player was pushed in the Brent Kern. Yeah. I mean, listen, that's the thing is when your momentum like is going in one direction, how do they want these guys to stop? Like, and 
the what he ends up doing to the punter, this is like a basketball, like the shot goes off, the follow through, and the guy like taps the guy on the arm and they call a foul. And it's like the ball is gone. The, the shot is off. The kick was off. Like him getting pushed and rolled into that punter, you know, that a, a roughing the punter happens when, when you just run right through him. When you're already pushed, where is he going? Where is that guy going to get out of the way of that punter? I, it, it's ridiculous. By the way, how about the wire incident? I, I was joking in the press box, but they couldn't tell if the ball hit the wire. I'm like, well, what, it hit a pigeon? Well, you were there. What did you see? I saw a ball hit the wire. Okay, but, so but on TV, case. I will say on TV, you could not see if it hit the wire cleanly. It appeared that the ball's trajectory, and they talked about how, you know, normally you have a spinning end over end. This thing was wobbling all over. I said, why didn't you just check the footage from the camera that's on the wire to see if the footage was moving? But you were in the stadium. You saw it hit. Like, they have seven officials. Not one said, yeah, that ball hit the wire. Come on. I, I, yeah, I sit next to John Kincaid, and we're like, oh, wow, this punt's going to be bad. And then you see it kind of go in a different direction. We're like, well, it hit something. Well, it hit the wire. That's what it hit. It definitely didn't hit a bird. Well, I, I would say this. I don't think I've ever seen the ball hit the wire, number one, in a game. Number two, I don't know that everybody universally would react the same way if it didn't hit the wire. Like, how would they all know to be like, it hit the wire? Like, you would have to know that it would have to have hit the wire for your reaction to be like that. How was the broadcast yesterday, Mr. Announcing Schedules? Good, man. I think Olsen, um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Olsen once uh, – Brady does or doesn't. If it, I think, look, well, you watch that game and then have to stick through Romo for a game. Whoo, Olsen looks like a Hall of Famer next to next to Romo. He's just very prepared. Uh, he he he's very educational. He tells you things that you're not. You know, uh, I thought last week in the Dallas game, he really was. He highlighted the whole Dallas snafu uh, with like two minutes and forty five seconds left. But it, yeah, uh, Olsen and Burkhardt, I think, are are a very good team. I, I think they are too, and I I got to watch most of the AFC Championship game in the Eagles press box because I've you know I'm focusing I'm writing stories and stuff, but they didn't have most of the sound on, so I couldn't really hear Nancy. You were Romo. lucky. Yeah, yeah, it's well I can't criticize CBS too much, but but <laughs> well, I, I, I will say this. I, I will say this. The problem I think with Romo has become. I don't think he prepares to be honest with you. I don't think he watches film. I don't think he prepares. Um, and he's just saying general statements. I don't think he knows the rules very well, so he's constantly deferring to Sterator. Hey, what do you think, Gene? You're getting paid twenty million dollars. You know, at one point he asked Nance if he would blitz on this play, and Nance didn't say anything because it's almost like Nance is saying they're paying you twenty million dollars to answer that question. You're asking me. I'm the play-by-play -play guy. It's almost you, like Romo. Do you has feel food. like the Do you feel like the NFL? Said to Tony after like the second year he was a broadcaster, we, hey, hey, you can't predict plays anymore. We talked about this on the podcast. Uh, for those of you, I, I do a podcast called Announcer Schedules where we talk about the announcers and and kind of you know th their performances and stuff. The guy that I do the podcast with who works in the announcing world behind the scenes, he claims that that's not the case that that they did not tell him to not predict the plays, which a lot of people think that they did because he doesn't really do it anymore. That being said, what I, one of the things I've heard is, you know, he's like seven years removed from the game now and that the game has changed a lot and that he hasn't done the study of these new looks and he doesn't know what he's looking at anymore. When he first got out of the game, he was predicting the plays and everything because he was so freshly out of the game that the offenses were still similar and the defenses were still similar to what he saw when he was playing. Now that he's seven years removed and he doesn't watch the film, he's not seeing the same offenses and defenses and that he's not as good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it is easy to sit on your fat paycheck. I will say that it's after someone pays you and, like I, I noticed he's turned into Kenny Galladay all of a sudden. The Kenny Galladay, I don't think he's been that bad. But <laughs> it, it, I, who is the Kenny Galladay of NFL broadcasters, Mike Gill? Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
Jeez, I mean, he would be the club. Not that it's that bad, but I'm saying he would be the club. Galladay got paid ridiculously. He makes like $14 million a year. He doesn't play at all. Um, I don't know that there's an announcer out there that just, well, Brady got a 30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's Tom Brady. He's the Kenny Galladay, I guess. Right. He got paid and doesn't, he hasn't even, uh, hasn't appeared for work once. If they bench Greg Olson for Tom Brady and Brady stinks, Fox will never hear the end of it. I know, and Olsen, it, it seems to like understand that the inevitable could happen. I think he's playing good soldier. He's been on a lot of podcasts recently talking about this possibility, but I, I think he's very good um, with his observations. He's educational. I think he does a really good job. I think they're a good team, too, because they sound like they're two guys that are having a good time doing it together. That's a key. And they've been doing it together. I remember um, I got to talk to Burkhardt before the season, and – Burkhart goes, I, I think our biggest strength is we've done this before. We've been together. Yeah. Um, and look, I know everybody thinks that the announcers hate your team. They don't. I've broadcasted many a games. At no point during the course of that game am I saying, am I changing that call because I like this team or that team better than the other because I have no opinion going into that game. So the broadcaster doesn't hate your team. What are your thoughts on Andy Reid now that the Eagles are going to face him in the Super Bowl? Jeez, I mean, this story is pretty outrageous. I don't think we, I don't think we do a good enough job. Um, he is the Tom Brady of coaching. Think about this. I mean, this guy was a nobody. Nobody knew who Andy Reid was. He wasn't a coordinator. He never called plays. He was on no. It's two things. It, the story of Reid is unbelievable. He gets a head coaching job. Nobody knows who he is. And this is back when hiring a head coach that you didn't know who it was was a little bit different. Like now, these guys are, hey, you, he was the 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 water boy on on <laughs> John McVay's staff. Let's hire him. Back then, you didn't hire a guy that you just knew nothing about, right? You, you Andy Reid was. People were like, who the hell is this guy? We wanted and, Jim Haslett. <laughs> right. He ends up being. <laughs> he ends up being the. Greatest Eagles coach of all time, 14 years. He leaves, and now he's the greatest Chiefs coach of all time. And this is coming from a guy that nobody had any idea who this guy was. His story is unbelievable. And the story also of the Eagles uncovering these guys, finding Andy Reid. Yes, they make the mistake with Chip Kelly, but they quickly realize they make a mistake, get out of the mistake. They go get Doug Peterson, another guy that nobody had ever Quite frankly, if you didn't live in Philadelphia, know that Andy Reid had Peterson on his staff and that Peterson played quarterback here for a year, nobody would know who Doug Peterson was when the Eagles hired him. He was not up for any jobs. His name was not mentioned anywhere. And the Eagles hire him, and then they find Nick Sirianni. So the Eagles organization, the job that they do in, in uncovering these coaches is just as uh, – should be just as – there's an article for you, Jeff – the Eagles, the job they do in uncovering, how do they find these guys? What is the process that they found? Nick Sirianni, no one's ever heard of. Go back to Andy Reid. What was the process of what Andy, what stood out about Andy Reid that they found and, and hired that guy? It's truly amazing what he's been able to do. And look, that Chiefs franchise, they've been in the championship game five straight years, a la the Eagles, when they were here four, uh, 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 I don't think they were four in a row, four, well, four. Four in a row but four NFC championship games. This Andy Reid has gone down as probably a top five head coach of all time. This is so I am the king of Andy Reid's stats, especially with the Eagles and the Chiefs. He's the first head coach to ever win two to ever win 10 plus postseason games with two different teams. He's the first head coach to ever take two teams to four straight conference championship games. Oh, the oh, by the way, they were all at home. He's the first head coach to face his former team he coached in the Super Bowl, and he took that team to the Super Bowl. That he's the only coach to ever do that. He's doing stuff you've never heard of. Like if people want to tell me Bill Belichick's better than him, I said take away Tom Brady, and I'll tell you how good Coach Bill Belichick is. That guy couldn't win dog crap in Cleveland. He's not that great. It, it, Bill Belichick is the greatest defensive coach ever, but overall. Andy Reid is a top five head coach of all time. Bottom line, I don't care what Eagles fans think. It's, it, oh, hey, what do they think with him? That standard was set for today because of him. Look, the Eagles organization is what it is 
today and over the last 23 years because of the foundation that Andy set. Um, I saw somebody tweet the other day about how and this is coming from a Cowboys guy who generally is pretty biased towards the Cowboys, which was the Eagles have become the standard of, you know, yes, they haven't won this ridiculous amount of Super Bowls a la Dallas or San Francisco, um, Pittsburgh, the Patriots. But the modern day, what the Cowboys yearn to be is being – this team that is constantly in play for Super Bowls and to get there for two times in five years to win one. That's what the Eagles standard had kind of been become in the Reed era was that, you know, you are going to be in play for Super Bowls every single year. And while you don't win it every single year, um, that you're constantly right there, that you are one of the teams that is constantly mentioned. And Andy Reed has made look the Chiefs were a franchise that was not known for Super Bowls. I mean, now it's just a fait accompli that they're going to be in the Super Bowls. Now Mahomes makes a big part is a big part of that. Um, but remember Andy Reid, who was not a great GM with Philadelphia. I think that was one of his downfalls. Was that he was had, the downfall. Of the Andy right, Reed. he had too much uh, too much hand in the roster decisions here. Um, but he makes a lot of the roster decisions in Kansas City, and one of them that they made was to trade up to get Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes was not a top five pick. I mean, they got him somewhere around what? 10. 10, 11, 12, he somewhere was, like that. He was so, 10. Um, yeah, that was the big move that Andy was a part of. So, yeah. My thing with Reed is when you see how dominant the Eagles' offensive line is, how dominant the defensive line is, and how they are on this never-ending search for a franchise quarterback. That is what Andy Reid installed in this system. People don't remember the atrocity that was Ray Rhodes. He could wheel you to a victory, but that man had one of the worst offensive lines I think I've ever seen. Rich Cotite was somehow just as bad, if not worse. Buddy Ryans was terrible. The, the last time the Eagles had a good offensive line before Andy Reid was with Dick Vermeil and Guy Morris and Jerry Sizemore and guys like that, Eagles fans. I, yeah. I know some some of you know who they were. But they, remember how many different starting quarterbacks the Eagles had in the Rhodes era? It's They couldn't pick a guy. And people well, were the, uh, you mentioned ahead. it, though. Growing up, the Eagles always had the worst offensive line. They were always the worst offensive line ever. And – that changed under Andy. He prioritized the offensive and defensive lines. And the standard that the Eagles have now with their offenses and defensive line, look, I know there's a lot of Howie haters out there that the Howie haters have turned into like Cowboys fans. They just kind of vanished and try to act like they've never said anything bad about this guy. We keep receipts. Um, I don't need a receipt. I've never been a Howie hater. I have always said – you're lucky to have this guy. He built one Super Bowl champion. There's a good possibility that he will build a second Super Bowl champion. He's built two different Super Bowl teams, not to mention he had a hand in a lot of the Reed years as well. Um, yeah, the whole Howie hating thing just shows, <laughs> well, people are just not, they don't know the game as well as they think they know the game, right? They, they yeah. just go off of, you miss picks, people. You're going to miss picks. And, yes, missing Justin Jefferson for Jalen Rager is an awful miss. But every team in this league has many picks where they miss. You know how many teams missed on Justin Jefferson? 21 of them. Here, here's one for you, Mike Gill. They call Brandon Bean one of the, just, one of the best GMs in football. Who was his last Pro Bowl pick? The last Pro Bowl pick he drafted. Who, who, Bean? Yeah. Who do you think it is? Uh, man. How long has he been? Did he draft Allen? Yeah. That's the last one. I was going to say, so he that would be it, right? He hasn't I thought drafted. this was like a trick question, as if he yeah. didn't draft Josh Allen. No, no. He hasn't drafted a Pro Bowl pick since Josh Allen. That's 2018. And you wonder why the Bills are where they are. Listen. Yeah, and look, Howie's strength had not, for a while there, had not been hitting in the draft. And and I thought that was a big thing, but that wasn't – they had a couple of years where, you know, you're not going to hit the draft all the time. But what the Eagles were doing, um, you know, like they picked Dillard, and the Dillard thing doesn't work, but then they get Mylotta. So it's like, does it cancel out? No, you want both picks to work, but you can't have both guys at the same position working – 
they end up finding Mylotta in the seventh round. I think Dillard could actually play if he was given the chance. The problem is Mylotta just took the job and never gave it back to Dillard. Dillard's going to get paid, by the way, and he's going to start somewhere in this league and turn into be a really good left tackle. Uh, they have found guys, little diamonds in the rough gems. But the thing that Howie does that I think was just not appreciated enough, again, I'm not sitting here saying he's some super drafter. He's not. He's made a lot of mistakes. Although the drafts the last couple of years, I think he, he's done a much better job. And that said, what he has done to keep this team constantly, constantly competitive for Super Bowls is he manipulates the cap. He makes trades. He finds, you know, these – Free agents that they find, they fit in perfectly. I mean, he does a really good job in making deals where you're like, what other, no other GM thought to call the Saints for Chauncey Gardner Johnson? Like, no, they didn't because Roseman outworks them. Roseman just finds ways. The trade he makes for A.J. Brown, that trade's available to everybody. He makes yeah. the deal. Nobody else made the deal. This team would not be where they are if you had a GM, a, a regular football guy GM running this team. Those guys are prone to make mistake after mistake after mistake, and we see it all over the place, th that these teams, they are not, not savvy in the front office. The Philadelphia Eagles are the savviest team in the front office. They've been – they run circles around teams. And why do you think that every year they lose two and three guys – and, and girls from that front office because everybody wants to know what is he doing that we're missing out on. Yeah. That's your sign right there that the Eagles are playing chess and other front offices have been playing checkers. And it's a shame and it's sad that this fan base did not see that for all these years. And the number one piece of the chess game, the Eagles have a top 10 draft pick and are going to the Super Bowl. So yeah, that's that, another, Mike. I mean, think about that. Well, San Francisco too, last year, you know, they end up drafting, they trade all those picks to go up and get Trey Lance, but that was their moment and they botched it so far. I mean, the Lance thing hasn't worked out. Um, this is where like the rubber meets the road for the team like that. Now they have to decide what to do with the quarterback position. Do you take the guy that you drafted, you know, in the number what two or three overall and given all those picks for? Do you go back to him? Does Purdy factor into this thing? Now he looks like he needs Tommy John surgery, possibly. Um, how does that affect already a guy who was did not have a lot of velocity on the ball? Um, and then, you of course, you always have Garoppolo. And then there's, of course, Brady kind of hovering. Do they get into the Aaron Rodgers stuff to try to get one with this window of this team? They're going to be really interesting. But, um, you know, one of the reasons that Philadelphia is here and San Francisco is not is because Philadelphia, their philosophy, and this goes back to Andy Reid, is that the backup quarterback position is more important than the starting safety. And they invested in that backup. And I remember when they drafted, I used to do uh, my show, uh, Broads was my co-host at the time. Hunter Brody from 97.5 The Fanatic was my co-host. And we battled, man. We battled. I said, I don't have a problem with the pick because the either. Eagles organization values backup quarterback more than they do starting safety. And that goes back to Andy Reid. They always invested money in the backup quarterback. They always had a quarterback, Kevin Cobb, A.J. Feely. Uh, he drafted Foles so that they could always be in position to trade that guy, get more in return. And if somebody got hurt, that your season didn't go crashing down. And when the Eagles went and got hurt, it just showed again that the Eagles value that position. And San Francisco has unfortunately botched the position. And that's what's held them back, I think, from getting a Super Bowl. They just have not been able to get that guy. When they drafted Jalen, I remember people being upset. And I said, I understand why they're doing this. And – a lot of people were upset over what I said. I said, do you guys not remember the playoff game when Josh McCown was a, an essential stiff in that game because Carson Wentz couldn't last nine plays? He was terrible. I said, if the Eagles had a real backup quarterback, they would have won that football game. Seattle didn't do anything impressive. Josh McCown couldn't run, and he was injured on top of it. When they got Jalen Hurts, I'm like, okay, well, if Carson Wentz goes down like he always seems to do, at least they have a guy who they could develop, and he's cheap. He's on a rookie contract. Well, I think this goes back to Roseman understanding 
that the Wentz thing was not what they wanted it to be. It was not going in the direction that they wanted and, di- and knew that this thing could go off the tracks. They saw the foresight of that and took a guy that they really liked in the event that Wentz just was not the same player and this thing went awry, and that's what ended up happening. I think they saw it a year before a lot of people did. And, you know, Joe Santa Laquita wrote that article that people blasted him for. Um, and at the time when they wrote that article, I said, look, maybe there's something to this. That You know, he did not play well. Maybe in that locker room, people are not meshing with him. And that the Eagles, they're in that locker room. You can see, is everybody going up to the quarterback? Or people, you know, it's like the, the movie um, Draft Day, where why didn't he get drafted number one? Well, nobody showed up for his party. Well, were people showing up to Wentz's stuff? Did people like him? They could see that way before we could, you know. So uh, I give them credit for the foresight on that day to say, look, something's up here. You don't just draft a quarter in the second round. Look, Green Bay, they took love. He's been sitting there for three years, right? Um, Because they had the thought that this whole um, Rodgers thing could go awry. I just think that the the, the Packers played this wrong. I don't – they feel – I feel like the Packers let Rodgers hold them hostage. The Eagles said, Wentz, you're not holding us hostage. You're out of here, dude, and we'll take the hit. The Eagles' front office certainly had played the Wentz thing right. I think the Packers' front office wanted to hold on to Rodgers, hoping that he could do something that they haven't been able to do. Mike Gill, it's always a pleasure having you on. Good morning, NFC East. Are you going to be at Ocean today by any chance? I will be at Ocean um, today, and I will be at the Super Bowl next week. So, uh, yeah. So so we're going to have to meet up and get a beer next week. You're going to be out there? I will be out there. Yes, we will. I'll be out there um, leaving Tuesday of next week, and I'll be doing shows on um, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Okay. Are you staying for the game or are you coming home? I will not be there for the game. I am leaving Friday night. All right. Well, I, either way, I'm going to be down in Arizona and we're going to. Maybe. I don't know. The Eagles sent out something last week about if the Eagles made it that uh, I didn't read that email yet. So maybe I will stay for the game. Yeah. I, I, I think you, you can still apply for credentials. I know that I'm definitely doing the media stuff. If I, if I don't cover the game, it is what it is. I, I'll have a good time. Yeah. I, I don't need to go to the game. Uh, I, I'd much rather watch Greg Olson. <laughs> there you go. Mr. Announcer schedules himself. Uh, Mike, always a pleasure having you on, my friend. All right, Jeff. See you. Yeah, I'll talk to you next Monday. All right. My, Mike Gill, everybody. Yeah, Glendale's going to be a lot of fun Eagles fans. Uh, I hope you guys are going out. Uh, again, I know so many members in the Eagles media, Chiefs media. I know a lot of Eagles fans and a lot of Chiefs fans. It's going to be a really fun Super Bowl for me. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Uh, th- this is the dream Super Bowl for me. Seeing the Kelsey brothers uh, face-to-face, seeing Andy Reid face his former team. It, you know, th- Thank God the Eagles got a Super Bowl. Thank God Andy Reid got his Super Bowl. So it's really not as big of a deal as you want to make it a uh, Jalen Hurts and Patrick Mahomes, uh, the top two guys in the MVP race. It's it's going to be a fun time, and you're going to hear it all next on Birds 365. Joey McDonald and John McMullen. This is Good Morning MC East. My name is Jeff Kerr. Have a good day, guys. Remember, Eagles are going to the Super Bowl.